Father, we just thank you for a time this morning that we have in your presence, in worship, and now as we come to your word. Thank you that your word is alive, that it is able to accomplish all that you sent and continue to send it forth to do in us. We pray that it would have its work through the power of your spirit, Lord, cause your word to bear fruit in our lives for the glory of your name. Help us, Lord. Help me and help each and every one of us to have listening ears to what it is that your spirit is saying to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. So grab your Bibles and turn quickly to the book of Acts. We're continuing our series. I know we've had a few interludes along the way, but continue to make our way through this wonderful narrative and this account of the early church and all that the Lord has done and continues to do, and even in our day, continues to unfold as he accomplishes his great commission set in motion to proclaim the gospel the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to read really one verse is the focus this morning. Acts 13 is where we are currently situated and we've seen the um, sending off of Barnabas and Saul on what is the first missionary journey, first of three, some would argue four or 3.5. We'll get into that as the story unfolds. And as we talked about last time, if you can think back a few weeks ago when we were in this passage, we saw that the Spirit brought together a whole lot of people in Antioch. In fact, they were marked by the Lord's presence in their midst, so they send down Barnabas, and Barnabas grabs Paul, and he teaches the church for a year, and it's out of that community that the Lord has brought together, a community that seeks, sought after the Word of the Lord, it says... In chapter 13, verse 2, second half, it says, The Holy Spirit speaks and says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then in verse 3 of chapter 13, Then after fasting and praying, this is the church of Antioch, the believers that had gathered there, they laid hands on them and sent them off. Now really the one verse this morning that I want us to continue in this series with and ponder its meaning this morning is verse 4. It says, So being sent out, you can underline if you're into underlining or highlight on your electronic devices, but take note of this phrase here that Luke intentionally pens. It's the Holy Spirit's directing him to write. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, it says, They head off, Seleucia, Cyprus, and thus begins the first missionary journey. See, again, Luke is underlining something very clearly. The Holy Spirit has spoken, but Luke wants there to be no doubt in anyone's mind that this, in fact, was the leading and it was the sending of who? The church alone? The apostles of the church he makes it very clear, doesn't it? This, this is a sending out, and this is the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I know I've made reference of this reality as we've gone through the book of Acts, because Luke, from time to time, or continually, we could even say, highlights. But I want to focus this morning on this reality of what it means to be Spirit-led, led by the Spirit. We talk about what it means to be spirit filled. But what does that actually mean? Remembering that even over the last few chapters, Luke has taken great pains to, to paint this story of the leading of the Holy Spirit as the door to the Gentiles is opened up. Cornelius, we see he has a, a vision of an angel. He gets this promise, you and your family will be saved, call for Peter. Peter, of course, he has this vision and he gets placed in the middle of a problem, doesn't he? Arise, go and eat, this tension, this struggle. But in the midst, what is clear? It's the leading of the Holy Spirit, accomplishing what he wants to do. We've seen as I've already alluded to, then the Lord brings together these, this group of people. He brings in Barnabas and Saul. It's very clear that the, the Holy Spirit is upon them. It says the hand of the Lord is there. The Holy Spirit was working mightily in their midst. What is clear as the church of Antioch is brought together? The leading of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit leading his people. And then, of course, as we've just read, as Barnabas and, and Saul are sent off, what is it that Luke highlights again? That the Holy Spirit speaks, and then the Holy Spirit leads and sends off Paul 
and Barnabas as they head off on this missionary journey. The common denominator is this. There's this undeniable leading of the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's look at one more passage. Jump ahead to Acts 16 because I want you to see this here. And I picked this one because it's a bit more of a a controversial, mind-boggling, strange reference to the way the Spirit leads them. But it says this in Acts 16, 6, that as they, this of course is Paul, and at this time we've got Timothy and Silas also in the picture, but it says as they head through the region and various towns in the region that they're in, it says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, if that doesn't kind of wrestle with your mind a little, I don't know what would. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit to do what? To preach the gospel in Asia. You think, well, hang on a sec. Wasn't it the Holy Spirit who commissioned them? I mean, it's, this, this is his idea. It's his orchestration. He sent them out to do what? To proclaim the gospel. And all of a sudden here, he's preventing them from going into a particular region, Asia, Asia Minor, we could call it, and not the Asia that we think of. Now, why is that? Did the Lord not care about Asia, this particular people group? He said, well, they're not worthy of the gospel. That's not at all the case. And in fact, the gospel will be brought to them at a later date in the next missionary journey. What it speaks to me is that, you know, it can be the right thing. And I'm sure Paul and Silas and Timothy, as they're heading off, they're like, well, this this makes perfect sense to us, doesn't it? To head into this particular region. God's commissioned us to preach the gospel. Therefore, we must go and preach to everybody who comes across our path. And yet, as they go here, the Lord says, no. Now, it can be the right thing and the right motivation, but the wrong timing in the Lord. I think too often we jump into things because we think it's the right thing. And it could still be the right thing. It's just not yet the right timing. We've got to know the timing and the leading of the Lord. That's why it's so important. And it continues on. So they were forbidden to speak the word in Asia. And then it says in the very next verse, and the spirit of Jesus did not allow them as they attempted to go into this other particular region. Again, we see this correction of the Lord coming and directing and saying, no, you're not to go there. And then, of course, in the next verse in chapter 8, it says they go down to Troas. A vision appears to Paul in the night. There's a man, Macedonia, standing there urging them to come which, of course, they then perceive is the Lord calling them to go into a different area. So what do we see through Acts 16, through Luke as he pens this account? We see a God who is committed to leading his people. He's not a God who just kind of sets and forgets. He doesn't say go and preach the gospel. He doesn't even say to Paul and Barnabas as they head out on this mission, you're called to do it, so off you go. I'll just bless you wherever you Go. He is a God who is specifically involved in the unfolding of his mission. Yes? He is. And I think this is comforting. You see, he's not a God who leaves us just to figure things out on our own. Say, well, I spoke once, and once is enough, and from now on, it's over to you. You make it work. You just do whatever you'd like to do. He is not a God who leaves us to figure it out. He is a God who desires to lead us. In fact, the picture that Jesus uses, he says, I'm the good shepherd. It's like a shepherd and sheep. How often do sheep need the leading of their shepherd? Once a month? Is that enough? Once a year? The, shepherd need the, the, the sheep need the shepherd every day. Whether it's protecting from wolves, whether it's guiding them into green pastures, whether it's making sure they're, they're okay in and out of the, the pasture for, for safety and the sheep gate, etc., etc. I would suggest that this is not something that we need once or once a millennia or on the odd occasion. We need to seek and know and have this ongoing leading of the Lord at work in our lives, corporately, at work in our lives, individually. So here is the question as we ponder this. Who, or we could even say, as we wrestle through this, what is leading our lives? Who is leading our lives? Who, who, if you drill down, who or what is really at work leading and directing 
our lives. Now, I'll leave you to ponder that thought and we'll come back. But come with me on a bit of a journey this morning. I, uh, this week, as I was browsing the news, as I regularly do, I came across some articles concerning an author, Enid Blyton. You may have seen this. She is the, the latest victim to fall foul of what's become a very politically correct society, the so-called woke culture or cancel culture. If you didn't see the articles, we all know Enid Blyton, the famous author, wrote lots of kids' books, many that I read growing up myself. And she, like uh, many other authors and monuments and historical figures, has fallen foul because there are comments that have been perceived to be not politically correct. And of course, in today's society, that has led to the complete call to abandon her books and remove them from bookstores and tear down plaques bearing her name, etc., etc. And as I read articles like that, I like to think this, what is it that is driving our culture? And it will become important, but that's what I want us to wrestle through. What, what is it that really is behind driving some of these things in our modern, secular society? What is it that's driving this reality that we don't just want to learn from history, we want to tear it down, whether it's monuments, whether it's statues, or as one particular group was suggesting earlier this year in our own country, completely rewriting Australian history. Let's just scrap it all and rewrite it and include our communist roots and everything else we want to throw into the melting pot. What is it that is driving this culture? And I'd make a couple of observations. Some of them I've made before. We would all, I presume, agree that we live these days in a secular modernity or a secular society that has placed self or selfhood and the expressive individualism that is required to discover it at the centre of what it means to be human. In in other words, this is what we've, we've said, is that the purpose of life is to discover your authentic self. That's really what the meaning of life is all about. And your authentic self is found purely in who you feel you are. So that's, that's what we said as society. We've got to discover who we are, and that's all about who we feel. It's an inward journey. We've got to be introspective in discovering the essence of our authentic self. And expressive individualism is not all evil. But bear with me here. I know it's early morning. It's not all evil. In fact, one good thing about our modern focus on self is the fact that it has held up the in- inherent dignity of the individual. For example... There was plenty of eras of human history where everything about you, from your social standing, your status, your career, your religion, was purely placed upon you by society. You had no choice in the matter. Whereas it's the opposite extreme. We're all expressive individualists to some degree. I went into the coffee shop the other day and I love the fact that it's not only a flat white or a cappuccino anymore. You know, there's 15 variations of different brews and tasting notes and palates and hints of candy and strawberry. I mean, there's, there is choice in every area of our lives. So that in itself is not an issue. The problem is that we've elevated self to such a degree that we've broken it away from any rational, objective foundation. There's no framework. There's no transcendent order. There is no foundation upon which anything anymore is to be based. Now, one of the fruits, and let me introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Alistair McIntyre. He's a moral philosopher. He wrote probably his best-known work, After Virtue, back in the 1980s. And he coined a term right back then, before the turn of the century, called emotivism. And it's simply this. I'll give you the definition and we'll come back and unfold it a little bit. He says, Emotivism is the doctrine that all evaluative judgments, and more specifically all moral judgments, are nothing but expressions of preference and expressions of attitude and feeling. So what's he saying? He's saying all of our choices, all of our judgments, no longer have any objective foundation or framework. We're led purely by our emotions to discover for ourselves what is right. And remember, he was writing back in the 1980s and really predicting a lot of the things that we're seeing on steroids in our current society. It's a little bit like, let me give you, I know this is a little bit heavy, let me give you a picture. 
to kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about. We're discussing at our staff devotions earlier this week the nature of young kids' sport. We've got young kids who play sport. Adam was talking about his boys who started playing soccer. We've got at the moment uh, two of our girls who play netball. And it doesn't really matter what the ball sport is. You see this strange anomaly as you begin the game. You sit down the kids, you explain the rules. You say, well, you've got a ball. You've got to get it to the other end of the field and put it in the goal. And inevitably what happens? The whistle blows and there's this huge expanse of a field and this one little huddle around the ball. And they just move around the pitch all together and occasionally the ball might pop out and then they're back there in the huddle again. In fact, I, I spent a couple of years and my, two of my girls played hockey, which was a sport that I grew up playing. I tried to encourage them in that direction. They've since backslidden. I continue to pray for them. They play other sports now. But not, not only was hockey something that was rather chaotic when it was little, it was also dangerous because you've not just got a ball, you've got hockey sticks. You've got 20 kids and there's a ball and there's sticks swinging everywhere. Like they've got the power, they're not afraid to use it. And so what you regularly have to do, and so I coached my kids and umpired the games, and there's a rule. I say if it, if it gets like that, you've got to blow the whistle and you've got to get in there and you've got to pick up the ball and you've got to tell them spread out. So you tell them, spread out, spread out, everybody, you know, find your space. Whistle would blow, you'd throw the ball in, and what would happen? Everybody, and sometimes there'd be a few moments, you know, the kids would be like, oh, I can resist the urge, I can, I can stay here. But inevitably, for as long as it took to teach them the rules of the game, there'd just be this ongoing holy hockey huddle, and you just pray that everybody leaves the pitch with their eyes and ears and heads intact. But in a similar way, we live in this society where it's kind of like we've forgotten that there's any rules of the game. In fact, we've actually really in many ways removed the rules and said, the ball is all there is and that is your mission is to respond emotively just to whatever the issue, the current contemporary issue is. We've got to jump on that particular issue issue, forgetting that there's any rules and with any reference to anything other than what we're emotively feeling in the moment. Now, the danger of that, and we'll come back to that emotivism in a minute, because that's what I want us to just ponder through for a few moments this morning. But let's finish the thought process here. See, the danger is that when decisions and judgments are based purely on emotivism, as McIntyre calls it, it by nature militates against any notion of traditional external authority. Any absolutes, any rules of the game are actually rules that are clouding my ability to feel well. And McIntyre is joined with a, another social commentator of the last century. I've mentioned him before, Philip Reef. And by the way, neither of these guys are believers. Reef himself was an agnostic Jew. But he said this and long voiced his concerns that this is producing not simply an anti-historical approach, but a vested interest, this is his words, in erasing the history of those things that conjure up unpleasant ideas that might disrupt happiness in the present. So we're so focused on the present and the self and the emotive moment that we need to remove anything that would hinder us truly feeling and finding enjoyment in whatever it is that our emotions are leaving it leading us towards. In fact, Reef goes this far. This is a fascinating quote. He says this, his words, we are guaranteeing that this generation will be the first committed to the denigration, destruction, and erasure of the past, not only its artifacts, but its values and its social practices, which of course is exactly where we've ended up, isn't it? We've got Enid Blyton, we've got monuments being torn down, we've got history itself being rewritten. Now, if you missed a lot of that, the the headline is simply this. One of the great drivers of modern society, and I think it's important at times for us as believers in the church, we don't focus on it all the time, but we need to be aware of what is it that's driving the culture around us and how can we engage with that. If we're not aware of what's going on, then we can't be who we're called to be in reaching the culture that we see around us. So one of the greatest drivers of modern society is this emotivism 
and this emotively driven society. The ball is all we have. The rules of the game will only hurt us, which I would suggest is at best chaotic. At worst, it's downright dangerous. And ultimately, even the secular philosophy is saying it's self-destructive. It is. It just ends up imploding in upon itself. Now, rather than lament the fallout of the current secular society, my heart is to present that to us from this particular perspective. I believe that in many ways the church has not been in the midst of that secular environment a voice of opposition, but we've been a symptom of the problem. So let's talk about that for a moment. See, I've personally noticed something, and perhaps you too, throughout 2020, and I've thought of a few, on a few different occasions to address this and haven't until now. But it's been interesting that in the midst of everything that has gone on, there has been this rising up of emotive responses to different issues. In fact, I was talking to Adam, I think, a couple of weeks ago. He said, what are you preaching on? And I thought, bit of tongue-in-cheek, this is my cheekiness coming out. I said, maybe I could entitle the sermon, Should We or Should We Not Get the COVID Jab? I thought, that'll, that'll ruffle a few feathers. That'll get some people thinking. We're not going down there, don't worry. But I thought about doing that just to illustrate that there is so many emotive response to so many different issues. In fact, I've heard more conspiracy theories, more innuendo and emotional baggage in the last few years, certainly the last five years, than I have in the rest of my life combined. And personally, I actually happen to love a good conspiracy theory. If you want to talk conspiracy theories, book me in, let's chat for the night. I love a good conspiracy theory. But here's the reality, is that is a very bad basis to build your life upon and to determine your direction. And in the midst of all that, as the church, here's the question I want to ask us, what is leading our lives? What is leading our church? Is it the emotivism? Is it this reaction to the issue? We're just following the ball around? And, or is it that we are a people who are willing to actually ask a radical question, well, what's the Lord saying? What's the coach saying? Does, does he not have an opinion and perspective on the issues that are around us? And I want to share a a post that was put up by someone that I know, not personally, but he's a friend of the church. And in the midst of the, the noise and this crescendo of emotion that we've seen over the past years, everything from politics to pandemics, issues of race and individual rights, and not to say that those issues are not important and we shouldn't talk about them and we you know, don't live, we live emotionless and uncaring about the issues of the world. But in the midst of that, I do think we've been caught up in the tide. And in fact, one example has been the number of prophetic voices that have issued prophecies, and a lot of them have been proven to be false or to have not come to pass, even from people who I would consider reputable prof prophetic voices who have established ministries. Now, one gentleman is a gentleman by the name of Lauren Sanford. He's a guy who many in this church would know, some of them personally, and he is a guy who for many years has had a recognized prophetic ministry. Like he is on the ball and I have followed along his ministry and have, can vouch for the fact that he prophesies accurately and has over the years in many different ways. But he was one of a number who was caught up in this tide, prophesied some things that didn't come to pass and since issued a public apology. And I want to just read his words because I think it's revealing. And he said, I don't want to just apologize for getting it wrong. I actually want to explain what I believe is going on and why I got it wrong. He starts off, he talks about Kings 22 and this particular passage where Micaiah came before the king with 400 other prophets. And 400 prophesied this victory for the king. And I told him what he wanted to hear. And there was one in the midst who actually sought the Lord and prophesied that which was from the heart of the Lord. And this is his word in the context of that. He says, Until now I've always been the Micaiah in the crowd, standing against a prevailing stream, and I've been right over the years. And this was, by the way, I didn't mention this. He, he released this in January 2021 in response to some things that he'd released 
throughout the year of 2020. So he said, I've, I've always been the Micaiah standing against the prevailing stream, and I've been right over the years. In this case, I compromised that and allowed myself to be caught up in the prevailing stream. For this, I repent before the Lord, and I humbly ask the forgiveness of the body of Christ. Another element of how I got it wrong has to do with the tendency we have to hear what we want to hear. Strong desires, strong opinions play a huge role in distorting the words we believe we hear if we allow that to happen. What happens is that we sometimes hear what other people are saying, the noise, even other prophetic voices. It stirs us up emotionally, and in that emotional stirring, we build a bit on what was said, adding to it in the rush of emotion because the emotion carries us forward until the final product is no longer the word the Lord actually gave. And his concluding statement is this, I've learned a hard lesson that I pray I will not forget in the days to come. In the days to come, I will be redoubling my quest for intimacy with the Lord and his word in the quiet place. So what do we do with that? Do we hang the prophets up to dry? Do we burn them at the stake? I'd say absolutely not. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, do not despise prophecies. We need the prophetic word of the Lord. But, he says, test everything and hold fast to what is good. And in fact, I actually admire Lauren even more after having seen his humility in his honesty of calling it how it is. And I think all of us, to differing degrees, have in some ways been caught up in the swirling of emotive response to issues over the past few years. What I am passionate about in my heart, as he alludes to here, is that we would have the courage to repent and to humble ourselves and to seek to recover that which was lost. Because at its core, the church is called to be a prophetic voice, one that pierces through the prevailing tide, not just is caught up and goes along with it. And I think we have, in many ways, we've lost our prophetic edge because we've been lulled into to thinking, well, we've just got to chase after this and, and after that. In fact, even the language has changed a little bit. And I don't want to be too critical of this, but so often we, we talk about, well, I just feel this. I'm just feeling that. And I know what we're saying, and I'm not being too judgmental on, I, I feel. My feelings aren't bad. Hear what I'm saying. But what about, what does God actually saying? Like, are we just feeling or are we genuinely seeking the word of the Lord? Because that's what we need to navigate this season, is to grab a hold again of the prophetic cutting edge, the word of the Lord. I believe at times personally and the church in general, specifically at this time, that Part of the reason that we are having so little impact and so little effectiveness is we've lost this reality of being led by the Lord. The Lord's leading, just responding emotively to things that we believe are good and they feel right rather than consulting the coach as to what exactly it is that he is saying. We're not just feeling things. We've got to come back to that place where we know what it is that God says. And we can stand not caught up in the prevailing tide, but against it to proclaim His prophetic saving word. So how do we do that? Let's land there. And we could obviously preach a whole sermon series on how do we hear the voice of the Lord, but I think it really boils down to one simple reality, as Lauren himself said. He said, here's my response. I'm redoubling my quest for intimacy with the Lord and His Word in the quiet place. That's where it begins, that we're a people who actually want to get with Him, not just reading the news, not just looking for the latest thing that we can emotively chase after, but the secret place with the Lord, seeking His Word. And I want to invite us on a journey. And what I hope I have done this morning, and apology if it's been a little bit too heavy for some of us, but I wanted to paint a picture of the culture that is around us 
and to stir in our hearts this urgency and this need for us to be a people who can stand in the midst of it, who can be aware of the warning signs around us and who have that desire and that recognition of what we really need is to pursue the Lord and His Word and what He's saying, not just emotive responses to every issue that comes across our path. I want to call us back to to what it means to be a prophetic people, to be a people who are spirit-led. So I want you to think for a moment as the worship team comes back out and end with the question that we began with, what is really, or who, who or what, is leading our lives? Are we, if we're perfectly honest, more inclined to be a person like the the kids' sport game that's just running? It's just one issue, and then it's another issue, and there's something else, and we're responding emotively. Or are we a people who are standing there, listening at all times? What is the coach saying? What's the captain saying? What's he calling us to do? What is the word of the Lord? From COVID jabs to the calling of God on your life. What is it that God is saying to you? And what is it that we're choosing to build our lives on? Let's be a prophetic people. Can we pray? So Father, I just ask that whatever is of you in the sermon that we've just heard, would you cause those things and that reality to really challenge and convict our hearts. Father, I pray that we would be a people who are aware of the culture in which we live. We're not removed from it, but we recognize that there is this prevailing tide of emotionalism, of decisions that are based not on really any objective reality, But Lord, I thank you that you are a God who came and you said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. That you're a God who leads, that you're a God who guides, that you're a God who speaks to your people. And Lord, I I ask that we would be a company of people who know what it is to be a prophetic people. And by that, I simply mean a people who stand on your word, who stand against a prevailing tide. A prophetic word that that cuts through the, the lies of the enemy, the rubbish that we see all around us that brings your truth to bear in the lives and the hearts of people all around us. That your truth would would just shine forth like a beacon in the night. Help us, Lord, where we've been caught up in so many things that are not of you. And may we have that personal commitment and conviction to redouble our efforts, to get alone with you, to seek to know you, to know your voice. It's your promise, Jesus. You said, my sheep know my voice. May that be our testimony. We know the voice of the Lord. Our lives are built upon his word and led by His Spirit. I ask that in Jesus' name.